right? You can open up your Bibles to the book of James. As Jacob uh, prayed, we're going to be in James this morning. We're taking a break from the book of Romans, and over the next eight weeks, including today, minus Easter, uh, we'll be working our way through the book of James, which is such a precious gift from the Lord to us to get to receive such specific instruction that reaches into the whole of our life. It's just a kindness of the Lord and to get to see great things about the instruction giver in God that's revealed through his word is a true privilege. So this morning, we're going to be in James chapter 1, making our way through verses 19 through 27. And I want you to consider something. Have you ever experienced a situation like this where you are trying to give something very good to someone and they had the complete wrong disposition as you were trying to give it to them? You had a great blessing in mind and yet it seemed that they were completely unprepared to receive it. Maybe it's something like this. You're introducing your child to a new, wonderful dessert. You have a young child, and you want to introduce them to God's gift to mankind, cheesecake. (laughs) And you've got it on your fork, and you're going, here, try this. And in a moment of youthful defiance and foolishness, they don't want it. They've never had the rich treasure that cheesecake is, but they're rejecting it in their foolishness. They turn their head away. They complain about the utensil. Maybe you're getting ready with your family to go on a surprise trip, asking everyone to contribute to various tasks, only to find your request, which leads to great fun being met with hostility and complaints. Maybe it's something as simple as, child, go get your shoes on. That child has no idea what's awaiting them. The fun trip to Peter Piper Pizza. The extremely quick waste of money on all the machines there. (laughs) The thought of if, if only you knew what was coming. If only you knew what was in store for you. You would respond so differently. We're going to get a gift from the Lord to us this morning as he actually instructs us regarding the disposition that we should have relating to God's word. God has an an immeasurable, rich uh, wealth of care and instruction and encouragement for us in his word. And it's his kindness that he would give us detailed instruction on how the believer should respond to his word. We saw last week that James jumped right into this letter with detailed instruction on how the believer should consider trials joy. And what we're going to see this morning is James giving instruction regarding God's word. And James is really going to put forth, as I just said, that the disposition that the believer should have before God's word. You cannot, you cannot overstate the role of God's word in the believer's life. You can't do it. You can't overstate the role God's word is to have in the believer's life. And James is going to, in great detail, help us understand the disposition that we should have before his word. Let's read together verses 19 through 27. James 1, starting in verse 19, James says, This you know. My beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, 
the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate the proper disposition towards God's word. The believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate the proper disposition towards God's word. If you're a Christian, God used his gospel message to save you. And God is not finished with his word in your life. And it is imperative that you cultivate the right disposition before his word. In verse 19, James says, this you know. He's connecting his statement in verse 18 to this next next section that we just read. And look again back at verse 18. He says, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. And then in verse 19, James says this you know. In the original, James uses one word to communicate this, and it it carries the notion in this state uh, of a command. He's not simply reminding them that God saved them with the word, but he's instructing them to know this, to continually know this. Know and continue to know that God saved you with his word. This is why the believer who has been saved by God's word must, correct, must cultivate the correct heart attitude toward his word, the correct disposition Your disposition, what is that? It's the predominant or prevailing tendency of your outlook or mood. Characteristic, attitude, which brings forth a correlating action. We must cultivate the right disposition towards God's word. In our passage, we're going to see the proper disposition expressed in three ideas. And I have them for you up there on on the screen It's the proper reaction to God's word, the proper reception of God's word, and the proper response to God's word. We're going to make our way through those three points, and first we're going to look at the proper reaction to God's word. How should we respond to God's word? What should be our impulse reaction to God's word? Well, we see it start there in verse 19. Everyone must be quick to hear. Uh, The proper reaction to God's word includes first a quickness to hear. James says everyone, and this is a call for all of us to be quick to hear. There is no one who is exempt from this instruction of how we must react to God's word. We must all be careful listeners before God's word. It is to be an intentional receiving of God's word. The believer has a unique resource at his or her disposal that cuts to the heart. God's scripture is so precious to us. It instructs, it equips the believer for every good deed. And our attitude toward God's word must be to where we are quick to run to God's word. It is a privilege to read God's word, to study God's word, to listen to God's word, to have God's word preached to us to have God's word taught to you, to have God's word be on the lips of those who would care for you is an indescribable gift to be embraced and loved. And it is fitting and really the mark of a believer when someone desires to be near to God's word. In this instruction for us to be quick to hear Uh, there's really a warning that there is never a time you should trust an assessment that says, I need less of God's word and more of anything else. What else would there be? And you and I, we, we also must not put conditions on which passages we're willing to listen to in certain situations. 
In fact, it's prideful arrogance that would respond to God's word with an attitude saying, that passage doesn't apply to me right now. That's the wrong one. They should have brought something different. There is something to be learned and blessed by every page of Scripture. God's word is a means of not only delivering us from evil, but delivering us to glorious, intimate, worshipful fellowship with the living God. How do you view God's word? Are you quick to submit yourself under God's word? Are you eager to want to hear from God's word? Have you intentionally arranged your schedule to enable meditative time with the Lord in his word? Or is God's word an add-on that fits into your life when everything else allows for it to do so? To be quick to hear is to be available for it. And this spans really the whole of our life. It definitely pertains to devotion time. But it's more than that. Have you positioned yourself in life to be around other believers who will bring God's word to bear on your life when you need it? Have you positioned your life to be accessible? Quick to hear. Next we see a, a proper reaction to God's word includes being slow to speak. Being slow to speak. Do you see that at the end of verse 19? Everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak. This goes hand in hand with being quick to hear. One who is quick to hear is inevitably slow to speak. You will not be a good listener if you're consumed with your own thoughts, with expressing your own ideas. To be quick to speak will hinder your ability to listen well. Yet to be slow to speak, to be slow to express your own thoughts, is the call for the Christian in response to God's word. We cannot really hear God's words when we're so self-absorbed with our own thoughts. And the point here is that you're slow to speak. Not that you never speak. Yet your reaction to God's word will be so much more fruitful if you exercise self-control in regards to your speech. In addition, your speech will be much more calculated if what you are going to say is thought out and contemplated in light of God's word. The wisdom of God in this is so profound and, and it is only for our good. Even considering Proverbs 17, even a fool when he keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is counted prudent. Proverbs has a treasure of wealth pointing to the reality of being self-controlled in your speech. James actually has a treasure of wealth. Speech is found in every chapter of the book of James. Our tongue. We're going to be talking a lot about speech in the coming weeks. Next we see a proper reaction includes being slow to anger. As James is putting forth the proper reaction to God's word, he instructs us that we are all to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and then at the end of verse 19, slow to anger. The believer is to be slow to anger. The word for anger here is more than just a, a passing momentary irritation or displeasure. It is a strong, persistent feeling of indignation. It's an ongoing attitude of hostility. And the believer is to be slow to this. And the context is that they are to be slow to anger in receiving God's word. Do not trust or give in to displeasure or irritation over God's word. Have you ever felt this way? Something's going on in your life and somebody brings scripture to bear on your life and you're like, that's touching on something that I just don't want to have touched right now. And it just stews inside of you. Do not be quick to anger. Do not let your anger drive you. If you're quick to anger when confronted with God's word, there's a very high likelihood that you are angry in that moment at a very wrong thing. When the natural response of anger, it, 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 where the natural response of anger is often quick and uncalculated, James is saying, be slow to that. 
Don't let your emotional response get the best of you when you're sitting under God's word. You are not to lord yourself over God's word as if it has something to prove to you. It better meet my expectations, my desires, my perceived needs in this moment. You are not lord of yourself, lording yourself over God's word, and hopefully God hasn't written something that will set you off. No, you you submit yourself under God's word. Let me ask you this. Have, Have you ever gotten irritated by someone who just brought you a Bible verse to your problems? Oh, that's not compassionate. I'm going through this struggle, and they just shared a Bible verse with me? Where's the love? Where's the compassion? Where's the empathy? Where's the care? What a foolish response. What in the world would we want more to have brought before us in times of weakness and struggle and trial than God's word? We need God's word desperately. And why should we have a slowness to become irritated or angry? James actually tells us in verse 20. Look at verse 20. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Anger, bitterness, resentment can never serve the cause of Christ. The anger of man in response to God's word does not accomplish what is right in God's eyes. How can you be hostile to the word, which is God's truth, and not be hostile towards God himself? Do you realize that? When we are quick to anger, when we have hostility in our hearts towards God's word, that hostility is towards the author. Human impulsive anger stewing in the heart does not accomplish what is right before God. And the believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate this proper disposition before God's word and having the right reaction to God's word. The proper reaction to God's word. That was number one. Next, we see that the believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate the proper disposition towards God's word which includes, secondly, the proper reception. Number two, the proper reception. We see this in verse 21. Look again at verse 21. James says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Your proper disposition towards God's word includes a a proper reception, and James addresses two primary, primary areas that will aid you in receiving God's word. There is a putting off and a putting on that we see in verse 21. First, the proper reception of God's word includes receiving God's word in holiness. Receiving God's word in holiness. This is in the first half of verse 21. And this requires you to put things aside. And James says, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Any sin, any sin that would hinder your receiving of the word, set it aside, cast it off. Anything that would keep you from doing God's word, put it away. Anything that might dull your senses or your appetite for God's word, cast it aside. In reality, if we want to receive God's word as he desires us to do so, sin has to be dealt with. James says, put aside all filthiness. And the word for filthiness is actually closely related to the word used for earwax. That's an appropriate picture. Earwax collects dust and plugs up your ears so you can't hear. Moral filthiness in your life does the same thing spiritually. Your ability to discern, to understand, to hear, to see clearly is greatly hindered if sin is going unchecked in your life. 
If you're cultivating an appetite for sin, your ability to cultivate an appetite for God's word will be competed with, will be dulled. James also says, put aside wickedness. This is just a general term for evil corruption. This is deliberate, intentional sin. This is unchecked wickedness. This is the sin that you love and are unwilling at that point to give up. Don't think you can receive God's word as God intends for you to when you're holding on to willful evil. You're only deceiving yourself. You're only hurting yourself. And I'd ask you to consider even this morning, what sin in your life are you acutely aware of and not letting go of? Not putting aside? Uh, The picture here is much more than simply a, oh, I'm just going to set this aside. Just, I'm going to just put it right here. And I'm going to go to God's word, but I kind of want to keep one hand over here because this sin is, I don't want to get too far from it. That's not the picture at all. This is a casting off. This is putting aside. Sin has run its course in your life and you want nothing left to do with it. And so you are separating yourself from that evil, from that wickedness, so that you might cling to that which is precious and pure and holy in God's word. The proper reception of God's word includes receiving God's word in holiness, and we also see that we must receive God's word in humility. In humility. Look again at verse 21. There's the putting aside of sinful things and the cultivating of of holiness, and yet we also see very clearly there in the second half of verse 21 that in humility we are called to receive the word implanted. In humility, receive the word. Have a a meekness or a gentleness about you in your receiving of God's word. Humility includes a, a teachability, a submissiveness. We must recognize the authority that God's word possesses in our lives, and we must humble ourselves under it. There's no arguing with God. That might come out of our hearts at times. That's not God's desire for us. We need to put that aside. Rather, we need to, in humility, receive God's word. There's no resisting God's instruction to us. We are to be meek. We are to be submissive. We are to joyfully embrace his word, trusting in his good intention for us, trusting in his intimate care of us with his word. All skepticism is to be put aside when coming before Scripture. And James says, receive the the word implanted. This is what happened upon salvation. God implants his word in the heart of someone, and when it is fertile soil, it grows and remains within them. If you're a Christian, you have the implanted word. The preaching of the gospel mixed with faith implanted the word in your heart and by the Holy Spirit... Now, God's word is a crucial part of who we are in Christ. And the tragedy of all tragedies is that we would become indifferent toward that which God used to give us life. And James, again, as he did in verse 18, which we saw last week, points to the saving work of God to demonstrate the trustworthiness of what he is saying as it pertains to God's faithfulness. Look at the last clause in verse 21. He says, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. James is referring back to the point of salvation for the believer, but the word of God not only saves us in a moment, but James is also with it carrying the idea and the understanding that while God's word saves us in a moment, it brings us on until the fullness of that salvation is experienced. God's word, which is able to save you and to keep you saved and to bring you to the fullness of that salvation in the eternal state. Receive that word in humility. 
You can receive the word of God in any situation, trusting wholly in the faithfulness of God to his loved ones, to his children, because this is what can save your soul. This is what has saved you, and this was what will bring you to the completion of that salvation. This is so incredibly comforting to think about. You can trust God. You can trust God in his word and humbly submit yourself under it. And one of your sweetest comforts in that moment of difficulty, humbling yourself under God's word, is to remember how he's used his word to bring about salvation in your life and how he uses his word to sustain you in that salvation until the end. What greater demonstration of God's faithfulness is there than what is found in the gospel? And the word here, the implanted word, is the entirety of God's revelation, but specifically as it pertains to the saving work in Jesus Christ, that God would send his son. That God would send his son to live the perfect holy life that you and I could never live, that we haven't lived, so that he might make atonement, so that he might die as a replacement, as a substitute in our place, so that we don't have to remain under the condemnation of that sin, so that we don't have to receive the wrath that we deserve in our sin, that God would do this that God would purchase our salvation at the cost of his son's blood. That Jesus would lay down his life so that we might have life eternally. And that he would do it with such completeness so that when God saves someone, it cannot be undone. They are secure and they have the hope of eternity, fellowship with God, worshiping God forever. What a precious, precious reality. And what confidence should flow in our hearts that if we can trust the Lord with our eternity, knowing that he purchased it at the death of his, at the cost of the death of his son, how much more can we trust God and his word for life's various issues and trials and struggles? He will be no less faithful. He will be no less faithful in whatever trial, in whatever temptation, in whatever struggle, in whatever hardship you are facing this very day than he was in bringing you to salvation. What a sweet truth. That is a a forming truth. That is a reality that impacts deeply how we must receive God's word in humility. It's also something that we must bring our hearts back to. When you find yourself struggling to humble, humble yourself under God's word, remember God's faithfulness in the gospel. Remember what he has done. This is true for believers, and the question that must be asked at this point is, does that describe you? Have you experienced this? Do you know God in this way? Are you one who has humbled yourself under the word of God? Or are you a skeptic? Have you approached God's word with arrogance and pride? I would plead with you, repent. Turn from that kind of thinking that would think that you know best. God knows best. God has revealed to us himself in his word. Repent. Find the forgiveness that you desperately need in your sinfulness and submit yourself to the Lord as your Savior of your sins and humble yourself under God's word and enjoy all the blessings that follow from one who would do so. 
The believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate the proper disposition towards God's word, first having the proper reaction to God's word, and second, the proper reception. And the believer, having been saved by God's word, must cultivate the proper disposition towards God's word, having the proper response. The proper response, we see that in verses 20 through through 27. James here shifts to the proper response to God's word. We've seen in great detail how we should impulsively respond to God's word, the kind of heart attitude we should have, and how we should receive God's word, and now we're going to see what we should do with God's word. How should we respond to God's word? Look at verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word. Obedience. Obedience is how we should respond to God's word. Active obedience. Look at verses 23 through 25 again. We see the proper response to God's word is an active obedience. Verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And then James gives us an illustration. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The proper response to God's word begins with an active obedience. After everything, the right reaction within you, the right view of God's word before you, you must do it. And and it's really sweet that he's just talked about how it's the word that God uses to save us. And then he goes on in the instruction to obey, right? He's providing clarification. There's nothing about our obedience that saves us. God did that. He used his gospel message to do that by the power of his spirit. And yet for one who has been saved by the grace of God, obedience is to follow. An appropriate reaction to God's word, what we do with God's word as one who has been saved by God's word is to obey God's word. What God's word instructs, it's not merely a nice word for someone out there. Oh, that is a precious truth. I know that's going to impact somebody. Someone really needed to hear that. No, it brings instruction to your life this morning. God's word is speaking to your life. And you must submit yourself under it, being a doer of God's word. And James says, not merely a hearer who deludes themselves. We can all put on an act. We can get excited with each other about God's word and then the quietness of our own time alone look very different. You could fool me, we could fool each other. But the reality is, is that if you're a hearer of God's word and not a doer and you're okay with that, you are primarily deluding yourself. To hear the word and be content to stop there, not actually doing it, is the ultimate self-deception. To think you can be saved by God's word, embracing it for salvation, but not for life is foolishness. It is not enough to simply be excited or enthusiastic about God's truth. You must live it out in your life. A calculated, intentional obedience must follow the hearing of God's word. Do you spend time thinking about this? After you hear the the preaching of God's word, after devotional time, do you give thought, God, how, how can I intentionally, actively obey whatever instruction might have been found in your word this morning? Sometimes we might not see specific commands in various texts, but there's implications. God, how can, I, how can I think rightly about you in response to what I've read this morning? How can I pursue holiness vigorously out of love and appreciation and desire for what is pleasing to my Savior? 
James gives us an analogy in the text, a, a picture. He says, for anyone who hears the word and is not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. Mirrors were typically hand-sized at this time, maybe a little larger, and they were typically made of bronze. They were a combination of copper and tin. That's how you make bronze. Some were made of silver or gold for wealthy people, and they had a little wave about them. You couldn't just easily gaze into a mirror like we can today and see clearly. You had to kind of give your special attention or focus, but you could make out and, and see and get a picture of what you looked like in that moment. For if anyone, James says, is a hearer of the word and not a doer, the second half of verse 23, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. There's no justified reason for forgetting. There is no acceptable excuse to come in contact with God's life-giving word and to not respond in obedience. James' picture here made me think of so many times where I'll pull out my phone and look at what time it is, put it away. Somebody will say what time it is, and what do I do? I got to pull it out and look all over again. I just looked two seconds ago. That's the idea here, except it's, it's a close looking. You're looking, trying to make it out, and yet that careful attention that you just gave to look and see what was there, you've immediately set aside. James continues on in contrast to the one who forgets is the one who actually does this, does the word. This is the positive. Look at verse 25. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. James uses uh, some really sweet uh, verbiage here to describe the word of God, the perfect law and the law of liberty. They're the same thing, but highlighting different aspects of God's word. The perfect law highlights the, the perfection of God's instruction and, and word there. There's no flaw in God's word. Every instruction is calculated and purposeful and for your good. And the law of liberty highlights the redemptive power of God's word. God's word and instruction brings freedom. While you are a slave of Christ, you are no longer bound by sin. All of the instruction from God's word is good and pleasant. As John says in 1 John 5, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. There's nothing wrong or innately burdensome or laborious about the instruction that God gives for believers. Any instruction from God's word that is difficult is difficult because of the sin that we bring to it. Not because of a flaw in God's instruction. God missed nothing. The one who looks carefully at the word of God and abides by it, does it, lives by it, lives in response and obedience to it. The one who doesn't forget but lives it out as an effectual doer, a diligent doer, one who is, who is faithfully living out God's instruction. This one will be blessed in what he does. God's blessing results from a believer's obedience to his word. Think of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who delights in the counsel of the Lord. Who, who doesn't live as the world lives. He'll be like a tree. You will experience true joy, true satisfaction, true peace, and progressive sanctification, being made more like Jesus over time when you are obedient to God's word. There is nothing on this earth that if you do will secure for you such riches as is described here. The blessing of the Lord. To have true joy. To have lasting satisfaction. To have calming peace. To have what James at the beginning of this chapter said awaits those who consider trial joy, which is conformity into the likeness of Christ to be brought to maturity in him. Our desire to obey 
is never to be rooted out of a, a merit before the Lord to make ourselves right before God. He has done it all in Christ, and yet a, a proper response to God's word in light of who he is and all that he's done is one that loves him and wants to keep his commandments. The proper response is an active obedience. Next we see the proper response is a controlled tongue. Look at verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, if you like hearing God's word, if you like talking about the things of the Lord, and yet you do not bridle your tongue, you deceive your own heart. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. One of the greatest revealers of where your heart is before the Lord is what comes out of your mouth. Simply doing Christian things isn't enough. Moral conformity isn't enough. Being excited in a moment about God's truth isn't of value in and of themselves apart from true saving faith. You see, all of those things may be really good, but only as they flow from a heart that is truly in love with Jesus. And sooner or later, one who is doing all of those things but doesn't actually love Jesus will demonstrate that reality through their tongue. The proper response to God's word is doing it. And if you think you're doing God's word, you think you're religious, and yet you have no control over your tongue, you deceive your own heart. What comes out of your mouth reveals what is in your heart. Therefore, if you have a religion that hasn't transformed your speech, your religion is worthless. Where the world scoffs, the believer trusts. And where the world curses, the believer rejoices. Where the world complains, the believer gives, thank, gives thank, thanks. Where the world tears down, the believer builds up. Where the world disputes, the believer promotes peace. And again, James' concern here isn't that you're deceiving others. The concern is that you're deceiving yourself. If you think you're okay and you think you are religious and a good Christian, but you have no control over your mouth, you are deceived and your religion is worthless. Because you've demonstrated it is flowing out of a dirty well. What does your speech reveal about you? And not your speech necessarily at church on a Sunday morning only. How about your speech with your spouse after a 12 hour workday? What about your speech with your spouse when the children were up all night sick? What about your speech when someone has the audacity to be the third car through the left turn lane when the light turned yellow and there was only two that should have gone? What goes on in your heart in those moments? What is reflected about your heart through your speech in those types of moments? James digs deeper into the correct response to God's word. In verse 27, we see that a correct response to God's word includes also an unconditional love. An unconditional love. And we remember this is all flowing from how the believer is to receive God's word or respond to God's word rather. The disposition that the believer should have before God's word. In verse 27 James says this, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. It's foolish to think that you can claim a love for God, that you can claim obedience to God, that you can claim a right relationship with God. I'm a religious person. God must be pleased with me and yet neglect his truth and have careless speech and then also have an unloving heart towards others. To think you're religious, to think you're right with God, to, to think that your relationship with God and, and with his word is right, and yet to put conditions on whom you will love, just doesn't make sense. 
In verse 27, James says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and Father, our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. Pure and undefiled, that is clean and that which is free from contamination. This kind of religion in the sight of God, our Father, which is really all that matters, right? It doesn't ultimately matter what we think of our religion or our, our faithfulness. What matters is what God thinks and And that which means much to God is that we take our eyes off of ourselves and have eyes for others. That's what James is getting at here. And he uses the the examples of especially those who are in particular need. Those who have experienced the greatest need at James' time, and it is typically the same today, are widows and orphans. The Jews were to have special provision and care that was to be given towards widows. And in large part, the Jews neglected to do this. Similarly, orphans, children who have no parents, were in significant need. And there was to be specific, intentional, helpful care for them. And while socially, what the Jews were finding is that Caring for people like this was not personally appealing for their own social agendas. Socially, they were not appealing. They gave no real benefit to one's social agendas, to their own personal progress culturally or or socially before the Lord, yet there is to be an indiscriminate love towards others. We don't serve others thinking of how it will get us ahead or how it will make us look appealing or how we might gain the respect of others. Rather, we selflessly, humbly, intentionally love. An indiscriminate love towards others. What we should have eyes for is not a self focus, but where are the needs? And how can I care for those in need? This is a call for Christ-like love to be flowing from the heart of every believer. The true doer of the word is one who has an eye for the needs of others and tends to those needs at cost to themselves. James says to visit them and To visit means to attend to them or to care for them, to watch out for them. And so for the true Christian, that one is to be characterized by having a pure loving heart that expresses itself outwardly to those who are in need. You aren't to think about God's word simply in an individual context. Rather, a, a proper response to God's word is where you are cultivating and have an intentionality to help others. And as an elder of this church, where over the last several years we have seen husbands die, a wife die, hardship hit various people's lives, I just want to commend you. You all have shown this kind of love, this kind of readiness to extend care towards those in need. What an evidence of God's grace in your lives. Thank you. Thank you for being this kind of people, these kinds of people. Still good to consider. Are we cultivating, are we pursuing a perpetual, habitual concern for others? Have you sought to position yourself to be ready to be generous to those in need? So you aren't to think about God's word simply in an individual context. Rather, a proper response to God's word is where you're cultivating and have an intentionality to help others. What kind of obligations have you bound yourself to for your own personal sake that keeps you now? from being able to serve others. It's good for us to consider these things as we make decisions about jobs, as we make decisions about expenditures, about what things we own and what things we 
borrow money for? Are we giving thought in those decisions to being ready to be a generous giver, to be available to care for those in need? Lastly, James, in a what seems like a passing statement, adds on that one who is responding to God's word is to have an unstained life. And while it might seem like a passing statement, it is crucial for the believer to live in such a way. Look at the second half of verse 27. To keep oneself unstained by the world. The last God-honoring response to God's word includes a willingness to apply God's word to your life without moral or spiritual compromise. To be unstained by the world, that's to be holy. And when James says to keep, he's emphasizing the continual nature of separation from the world. This is an ongoing responsibility and call for the believer to be unstained, to be unlike to be uncorrupted by the world. It's really to not have reproach in your life that demonstrates a world likeness. Those who are gods are to be characterized by purity. This isn't that believers never sin. Every Christian falls short of the Lord's standards. But James is speaking about the the basic orientation of our lives, What are you committed to? To whom are you committed? What is your life characterized by? Are you seeking to be as God calls you to be, or are you seeking to conform to the world? Are you allowing yourself to conform to the world? The Christian longs to speak and do only those things that are holy and pure and loving and honest and truthful and upright. And we pursue those things vigorously. The Christian is to have a love for God. And this love for God should fortify you against the enticements of this world that would bring blemishes or stains or reproach upon you. Keep oneself unstained by the world. We are to be influencers, not influencees of this world. We are to live set apart lives, holy and pleasing to the Lord. And in light of all of these things, we must consider what role does God's word have in our lives? Do you have this kind of disposition to God's word? We all should be eagerly striving to humble ourselves joyfully under God's instruction. James really addresses how you're to receive God's word in this passage. Obviously, there are certain ways that we can care better than others for each other. This isn't an excuse to simply throw Bible verses around and when it's hard for somebody else, condemn them for not receiving God's word appropriately. There should be a heart full of compassion and love and tenderness and empathy that we possess for one another. We need to pursue that. This instruction is primarily for us and what attitude do we have when God's word is brought before us? What a gift. James, one of the richest books on practical implementation of your faith, sets forth so clearly the prominence that God's word is to have in our lives. God's word can transform every area of our life. What priority does God's word have in your life currently? Do you see the importance of worshipful, prayerful, meditative devotion to God's word? And I would want to encourage you, if you feel like, wow, this sounds really great. I've never read the Bible. Or I've read very little. I I don't even know where to start. And when I do read, I don't understand it. I would ask you, please, 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 come talk to me or any one of the elders. We would love love to help you. We would love to help you. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your gospel that you have saved us. You have saved us out of our rebellion. You have saved us out of our sinful idolatry of ourselves and anything and everything but you. And Lord, you have given us life abundantly. And you have given us that which reveals you in your word. You have not left us merely to ourselves to figure out you or your desires for us, but you in your love have given us such wonderful instruction. Lord, I pray that we would love your word all the more. I thank you. Thank you so much for this church and how they demonstrate so faithfully a love for your word. I think this morning, there are probably some who have received some sense of a rebuke from your word this morning, and yet I'm confident that there are so many who are doing this so well. And I pray that you would help them, help us to excel still more in loving your word, in never putting up any obstacles, any contingencies, any ungodly expectations of of how we would be cared for but Lord, that we would run to hear from you from Scripture and that you would use your word to shape and to fashion us more into your likeness so that the light of Christ would be seen, so that you would be put on display as the great God that you are. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for our Bibles. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand and we'll sing together.